Thank you so much for inviting us and inviting me. Thank you. Really, what a, what a pleasure, what a highlight of the year to be back with you at the Asymmetria uh, annual uh, convenio and with a star panel and a star addition to the speakers you've heard so far, our very own Claudio Borghi. Thank you very much for joining us on this uh, discussion panel. Now, uh, uh, Alberto mentioned that we have, this is a birthday party, the 12th edition, but you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is another birthday, another anniversary. Uh, exactly 10 years ago, uh, a little bit more, but 10 years in calendar terms, was signed a document called the European Solidarity Manifesto. <laughs> and uh, this was, uh, I think, uh, the document which sought to find a way out of the asymmetry of the European Monetary Union. It imagined uh, a correction of the asymmetry by a revaluation of the Deutsche Mark, that is the exit of Germany. Now, this was obviously hypothetical and theoretical, but you know what it did? It created the international arm of goofy nomics asymmetria. Now, this is not the communist international, not the fascist international, what sort of international was it? Well, I think Alberto has given us the answer. It was the anticipatory international. The thinking which looks ahead. Jens said forecasting, Wolfgang looking forward. And in this half an hour we have of discussion of all the rich ideas we've had, I want us, please, colleagues, to look forward, analytically. Not what we think should be done, but what we predict will be done, for better or worse. And by the way, by done, I also mean in action. You know that famous saying in the European Union, they kick the can down the road. The, the decision not to act. If that is our prediction, what will result from that inaction? So there we are, that's our agenda. We have half an hour, and then we can all get some caffeine uh, re refreshment. And, and I'd like to start, um, I guess, with just a specific question for Wolfgang. This is kind of a question from the floor on the fiscal part of your, of your remarks just now. Uh, is an option for the German government and the German parliament simply to retrospectively re-legalize their budget? simply to have a majority vote in the parliament, not a, not a massive constitutional majority, as you were explaining to us, but simple, a simple majority, which by definition any government has, otherwise it would not be a government, uh, to say that we have an, an emergency, a new emergency, and therefore everything is fine and we go on with our budget. Yeah, let me answer this question briefly. Is they your just, microphone working? Can I just is check? it not working? I think it is, no? Yeah, yeah, it yes. is. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's work, it, they did it for 23. They had, for the, all the past budgets, they basically said emergency. The trouble is, you know, the, the idea of an emergency is something like COVID. The idea of an emergency is not like, oh, I need the money. I spent too much money. Yeah. I cheated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's why the country is an emergency. Okay. They're, they're difficult things. Or mm. I didn't expect that court verdict. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't say an emergency, you, you, it would not be a possibility to do this. So right. they are, you know, for 23 it's, it's passed. You can't unspend money that you spend. Yep. But for 24 it's open. And they will discuss this now, they will find out how much. And, it, you know, you all think you have to, in Italy you always pass your budget very early in the year. Uh, the Germans don't usually pass their budget until December. And, uh, and in the next one is not likely to be passed until the next year. It could go all the way to July. Uh, that happens before. Uh, and this one I expect to take a long time uh, until they find agreement and there will be sort of, at the moment everything is frozen and that, that, you know, that means there is pressure on them to get a deal. And you know, I, I would expect it to happen next year uh, in the first quarter. You would expect, so in the first quarter, you would expect that they it will, will be a, a fiscal concern. I, I, Christian Lindner, the finance minister, could not survive another 
declaration of emergency. Right. His voters would desert him. Okay. The others will insist on it. Either the coalition breaks up, that's a possibility, he goes into opposition. Uh, there will be a referendum in his party about whether they should continue, and that, that, that is another potential, potential breakup. So there, there is a, a scenario of an election, uh, an early election. Uh, this is a serious crisis. Der Spiegel just has a front cover yep. and basically have portrayed Olaf Scholz as a gambler who lost. Sure. And it's yep. really, the, the, this is a, a, the, the biggest political crisis I have seen in German politics probably since 1982. Stop. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest political crisis in German politics since the early 1980s. Italy, where is your leadership in crisis? You have lost German. Germany is now the leader. And Wolfgang has already explained to us the consequences of that on the European level, which is the subject I would now like us to pass to. The European fiscal rule, as a result of this German crisis, Wolfgang explained, uh, it will be almost impossible for the German government to compromise on the negotiation about the renewal of the euro-level fiscal rule. So that being so, what will happen? I'm going to turn now to, to Claudio. We have this negotiation on the European fiscal rule. We have this question of the recapitalization of the European stability mechanism. By the way, Italian mess. <laughs> In English, this means mess disordine. <laughs> so, now, now, Claudio, uh, this, uh, I don't want to be uh, indelicate here because the rest of us here on this uh, panel, we are all analysts. But uh, Claudio, obviously, uh, you, uh, uh, your party is a member of the government and so on, uh, but you know, you've heard Wolfgang's view of what the position of the German government will be on the fiscal rule question. Could I ask you, from the point of view of the Italian government, your analytical prediction? what will the position be on these related questions? The new fiscal rule and the uh, reform of the mess. <laughs> Nothing else? <laughs> yeah. easy, easy question. Okay. No, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, how, how, how can I say? Uh, it's... Uh, something that uh, should be looked into two different ways. The first one is uh, what we should do. The second one is what uh, still our colleague, uh, because the, the instinct is to, to say our politician, but um, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not fair <laughs> I have to say our colleague, uh, still have to understand about how things work. Mm. Because they know better than me, better than Alberto, how to make up laws. Uh, if ever you, you have to pass, uh, for example, uh, uh, a, a law that allows someone to be hired in that ministry, they are exceptional. Mm. Uh, but if you ask uh, what is the big picture, I doubt that many of them uh, still understand how it's working. Because what we started to project when we, we, when, when we, we made the, the, the uh, electoral campaign for the 2018 election, uh, you remember that uh, it was mostly based on the economy, has been overruled by what happened in the last term. Yep. We had crazy things happen in political, social, no, COVID. COVID. Uh, uh, talking, uh, sometimes there is uh, our hardline of followers that someone are there uh, that say, you are not saying anymore that you want to get out from the euro. And uh, the answer was, uh, well, <laughs> we had the problem to getting out of our homes <laughs> in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so because there was lockdown, because there was green passes or yeah. something like this. So uh, it, it was uh, that uh, madness that happened in these five years that sort of wiped out any kind of uh, uh, 
knowledge about what is the basis of economy that was making the variable moving in Europe and in Italy. So what happens? That our colleague at the moment tried to not to see that there could be some major shift in the future. They wanted to keep on doing what they are doing in the past with slightly more. <laughs> so uh, yesterday I was spent uh, one billion. Probably if I spend one billion and 20 million. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more, then maybe things are better. Or if I am, I am able to raise uh, the same amount of taxes with these taxes, adding something more, maybe I have more to spend. This is uh, things that you can see, for example, there is in this budget law, uh, there is a major shift that is uh, uh, the collapse of uh, the, the tax brackets. Yep. Well, this collapse in the tax bracket, uh, it's positive, but is projected to give uh, something like uh, 15 euro per month more uh, in the net salary of uh, the impacted uh, yep. people. You understand very well that uh, we are not going to change anything with 15 euro. Most of our budget at the moment is covered by a confirmation of a measure that was instead sizable because it was in the region of 100 euro per month in terms of additional wage, yep. uh, that, that, that is called the cuneo fiscale, I mean less taxes on, uh, on, on labor. On labor, yeah. But it was done only for one year, because if not, uh, it's going to impact the account for the yep. future, and so we uh, show ourselves yep. as a too uh, profligate uh, yep. and something like this. And, and, and so most of our budget of this year is simply a confirmation of that measure. So it means that we are putting 15 billion more without any sizable difference that will be seen by anyone, because it's the confirmation of what has done in the past. That means that we are making most of our financial effort in covering something that in real terms is zero because, of course, the inflation wiped out the very same amount of uh, money that we are uh, projecting in, uh, uh, of, of injecting in the economy, uh, but, but simply is on existence because uh, we had 8% inflation last year, 5% inflation this year. So we are talking about uh, in the region of uh, a projected 15% uh, inflation uh, for the beginning of next year. So no real impulse to demand from... No, from probably is contractionary no, because uh, I, I guess that uh, if we consider that the median wage should be, uh, I don't know, 1,600 euro, uh, that, that is very low compared to international standard, but uh, this impact of inflation probably would have needed 200 uh, euro per month, uh, simply in order to get even with inflation. So we have a, a sharp uh, cut in wages due to inflation that is not covered by the capacity of expense. Claudio, let me just stop you there for a second. Wolfgang has told us that we will have what economists call a pro-cyclical fiscal contraction in Germany. Pro-cyclical means that the cycle is going down, German economy is heading towards recession, whether it actually gets there is almost a detail. And instead of countering that with uh, an expansion of demand from the public uh, fiscal account, it's a contraction. So that's, the contraction is with the cycle, so very damaging. Claudio has just explained that in the third largest economy of the uh, euro area, Italy, the same, a pro-cyclical negative impulse. France better not even go there. I mean, uh, you know, Italy is meant to be the bad boy of fiscal policy, but really you should look at France. Uh, there's a, another speaker coming up soon who will perhaps touch on this question. <laughs> uh, so Jens, coming to you, you said that some of the ingredients, many of the ingredients for Euro crisis too uh, are forming in a kind of structural sense. Uh, but you cautiously and prudently concluded that you know, it would be uh, spurious to uh, 
forecast that the crisis will blow up in you know, weeks or months. But can I just put that to you again? Some of these ingredients look quite explosive. Uh, and if you have a political failure to agree a new fiscal rule before Christmas, which they're meant to do, uh, do you not see any uh, chance of financial markets uh, suddenly, uh, the lack of confidence in markets about the euro system you demonstrated very powerfully, that uh, the decline of confidence can suddenly tip, tip down more radically? Uh, mm. Can I ask so, you that? Yeah, so I think the, the one thing that's really important to keep in mind from a market's perspective, which then feeds back into the ECB, is that we have this inflation right now, right? So over the last 15 years, as soon as there was a problem, um, we started to think, oh, okay, we can always get some help from the central bank, right? So what's very different now is that we still have way above uh, target inflation. And that means that the monetary solution is kind of like not really an option, right? Because like, coming out and buying bonds at a time when inflation above target is like ECB essentially breaking its uh, mandate, right? So certainly that, I think, is a real issue. But if we think a bit further ahead, I think the fiscal pro-cyclicality becomes a real issue when it actually also coincides with the deflationary forces being back. Right now, right now we have this kind of weird transition period where we've had inflation for the first time in a while, and obviously from a pure debt perspective actually helps the debt dynamics, sure. right? Mm -hmm. But then, what happens after? And I think that's why, I, when I think about the timing, I think the real test is actually when that temporary period of inflation is over, what then happens? Will we still have pro-cyclical? Pro-cyclical sounds like a good thing. It essentially means just fiscal policy going in the wrong direction. That's effectively what pro-cyclical yep. means, right? So will that be the case in 25 and 26? So for me, that's the timing when these things really come home. And in terms of timing, I will also say, right, I speak to investors around the world every day, right? Uh, I have to follow Italian politics uh, because I get questioned about it regularly, right? But there's not an elevated concern about Italian politics or credit spreads in general, which you can say is surprising. But at this point in time, uh, credit markets are relatively calm. So it doesn't feel like we're just on the verge of something dramatic. So. I think for those two reasons, I think it's something that will happen over a longer period of time. Okay, so at least uh, <laughs> Jens tells us no, no early stage or uh, uh, market, uh, financial market driven shock. Well, that's, that's reassuring to know. Uh, financial but, markets are often wrong. Uh, but so. markets, yes, they, uh, they can be uh, discovered that they can change their minds quickly. Sure, sure. They can change their mind quickly. But, let me just pick up what Jens just said, that, you know, that inflation remains above target uh, in the uh, European economy. Well, that could also change quickly. Sure. Okay, so I can come back to you, Wolfgang. The, uh, uh, if the headline inflation is coming right down already, already. And the, uh, despite the price pressures from energy, uh, the, the weakness in the economy is palpable. I mean, do you think that uh, that the German economy could lead the wider European economy into a much sharper downturn in the coming months than perhaps, as Jens has told us, uh, financial market participants themselves are expecting right now. I mean, if the scenario were, um, uh, you know, I was always slightly on the skeptical side on inflation. I didn't you know, follow the markets and the central bank's optimism on, on, on its uh, inflation forecast. I always felt the pressures were higher. Uh, I still think they're higher. Than, than people think, um, uh, especially underlying inflation is still over 4% over annually, even though the monthly figures are lower now, so the, the trend is, 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 is weaker. Uh, but it is quite, the, you know, the, you, it's possible to have a scenario where you have above, inflation, above target inflation and below, you know, growth. below zero growth. And, yep. it, you know, this is a, 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 a scenario where the central bank isn't going to help 
a, a pro-cyclical fiscal policy, that combination is just a doomsday machine. Yep. Uh, so um, the scenario that you mentioned where inflation falls sharply uh, uh, is actually not the worst one because the central bank would then react with lower interest rates. Uh, so, so my scenario is slightly more pessimistic. Um, but, you know, I may be wrong. Maybe inflation comes down strongly and, uh, you know, I still see a lot of wage increases in the pipeline. Uh, trade unions in Europe are targeting... The thing is, central banks are targeting inflation. Trade unions are targeting the price level, yep. uh, which they have to do because their, their workers, their members sure. need to need to, you know, need to keep up in their real incomes relative to the rest of the economy. And when the difference between inflation target and price level target isn't that much, as it mostly isn't, that we're now living in a time when yeah. it is. Yep. And they have about, you know, they have some 10, 15% to catch up over a period of time. And, you know, that is a persistent source of inflationary pressure over a longer period of time. We see the higher deficits in the Eurozone you know, contributing to, 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 to more demand, even though Germany is now heavily pushing in the other direction. We have aging populations. Uh, so we have a number of structural factors that would suggest that inflation is, the, the, the base level of inflation is higher. Uh, I think there's a discussion to be had about the future of inflation targeting. You know, I've, I've been one of these old-fashioned un, or unfashionable you know, fans of G, uh, nominal GDP targeting, but that's not... That's not something you can say in polite uh, company. company yes, that's uh, nice. And uh, therefore, that's, um, that's uh, not, it's, it's also not going to happen. Um, uh, so, yeah, we, we, we have the, it's quite, uh, the scenario where the Eurozone goes into a deep crisis, one way or the other, is definitely, definitely there. Scenario where the European economy goes into deep crisis, one way or the other. I mean, I'm picking up from our panelists a paradox here. I mean, Wolfgang, I think if I heard you right, you were just suggesting that in the scenario of a more rapid downturn, in a way that would make things easier. The central bank could react quite quickly and, uh, and there could be some restoration of confidence. But I fear that from all our panelists in different ways, we are uh, picking up signal of a scenario of incremental inaction which just grinds the situation down. Claudio explained in Italian fiscal policy, just a little bit more of the same. In the, in the German context, just um, you know, uh, a, de a, de a kind of depressive policy settings, but you know, some pressures in the other direction. So the situation just grinds on and gets worse, and Jens Who's, who speaks to market participants, uh, picks up that there's no uh, anticipation of a sudden shock. So it's a kind of grim uh, grind down with a very precarious outcome out there. So I'm now, for the last five minutes of our panel, I'm going to ask our panelists to switch gear. I, I gave you your initial brief, which was to, uh, uh, to be analytical and predictive. Now I'm going to ask you what you would recommend. Now, of course, in life there are no magic bullets. And, uh, and also, I, please avoid answers which are nice but hypothetical, like the European Solidarity Manifesto view that Germany should leave the European Monetary Union or something like that. So something which may be unlikely, a little bit ambitious, but not completely uh, out of the question. Uh, what would that policy action, what would that response be at either national level or at the level of, uh, of the European Union, uh, etc.? Uh, and I ask Jens to go first. Sure. So, so I think once we've gotten through this period where we have to worry about inflation, then we can think about where we want to step on the gas, i.e. where do we want to spend in a productive way. And I think there's, uh, for me, there's like three areas, um, and uh, I touched on two of them in the speech, right? So you didn't I, mention climate, actually, which is... Um, yeah. So I think, yeah. I think the energy, security, and the climate uh, is interlinked. Interlinked. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an energy investment where it's a historical opportunity to get ahead, create security for Europe so we don't have to be under threat of all these external supplies, We've obviously had a situation with Russia. It could be other suppliers in the future. 
we need to have some kind of security that that's not going to be disrupted. So that's number one. Number two is that we need to be strong enough militarily that we don't have to, you know, worry about being threatened from all sizes. There needs to be an investment. Even in Germany, you can argue that this is an opportunity to say, okay, there's other types of inst industrial complex that's under pressure. Now we actually invest in some other things that from a multi-decade long perspective is going to give us some military security. I've, I've never had like to say these things, but the world is different now. And then the third thing I would say has to do with tech, AI, and so forth, right? So I'm involved in AI in one company now. It really opens opportunities that, that you cannot imagine once you've seen these technologies, right? Europe needs to be at the forefront. You can see companies that are successful around Europe, not the big companies in the DAX, but there's a lot of smaller European companies that are very successful in, in the tech space. We need to invest, make sure absolutely every opportunity is given to those companies so we can have job growth in those. Those are the three areas I think should be the focus. Great. Thanks very much, Volkang. In, in addition to this, I completely agree. Uh, in addition to this, I, I, let me focus on the future of the euro. Um, I, you know, the, the euro as it stands today is not sustainable. Uh, that doesn't mean it will end, but it means it either needs to be made sustainable or it needs to end. And uh, what it needs to for sustainability is a capital markets union, a fiscal union, and also the completion of the banking union. So it needs a, 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 a proper federal structure. Uh, I call it by some other name if you don't like the word federal, but it needs a, a, a European structure uh, to counter, to, to, as a counterpart to the monetary policy. The EU should, uh, here I'm just saying what should happen. You know, my, my preference would be for that to happen. Yep. But my secondary preference for, for would be that if it were not to happen, then I don't think we should pr proceed with a monetary union. I think it is irresponsible to have a monetary union without a fiscal union forever. <laughs> well, thank you, Wolfgang. I, I guess the, the parting of ways which you describe that moment of crunch will come as and when the next crisis breaks. If not perhaps in the next few weeks, if, if Jens is right, but uh, waiting for us out there. Last but not least, Claudio Borghi, um, what would your priority be on uh, the, in this whole policy nexus? Uh, I can tell you something that uh, already happened and it was not the marginal increase of things in our economy. Um, in 2000 and, uh, uh, what was 2020, something like this, there was the last uh, projected budget uh, by uh, a time, and there was a not fully competent uh, uh, Minister of, uh, of Finance, <laughs> that was Mr. Gualtieri, uh, that... Uh, <laughs> That, that anyway, that, that he projected the budget uh, where there was uh, for this year 150 percent debt to GDP ratio, and it was validated by you. Then there was the the, the, the super bonus. I mean the uh, the construction bonus that found out that it was in the region of 100 billion euro in the economy, not not forecasted. Yep. because it was not in the budget. What has been the result of these 100 euro badly spent? Because uh, in the past, uh, we, have, we have seen something that was very well spent. For example, there was a 30 billion out of the budget spent by uh, then minister, more competent, Tremonti, uh, <laughs> in order, in order to, to make uh, the high-speed railroad yep. uh, from Milan to Rome. That was uh, very well spent and uh, probably is going to repay itself uh, in many times uh, in the future. Uh, this has, has decided to be badly spent in uh, very few homes uh, that has been refurbished for free. Uh, and and uh, OK. Anyway, this 100 billion, once has been acknowledged by uh, Eurostat, what is the result? That at the moment we had a much higher deficit in the past because it's been allocated. But the debt to GDP is 140% right now. So 100 billion spent more than what it was supposed to do. Reduction in the 10 public debt lower ratio. of public debt. 
So what means that we need to spend more? We need to spend more in infrastructure, we need to spend more in productive things, we need to spend more on energy, we need to spend more in defense, but not to send weapons to someone else, but for us. Uh, and uh, because, uh, because we need uh, at the moment uh, to be ready to answer to all this growing external menace that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are looming in the shadow. Uh, but uh, we don't need any kind of uh, uh, ESM mess or whatsoever that are simply uh, all, all the tricks uh, that, uh, that, 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 that are, are, are thought uh, 20 years ago. So, so it's nothing that, that has to uh, any, any kind of uh, 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 approach sensible to what, is, uh, what we need. Germany has to spend more, not less. Germany, Germany the, I mean, the countries that is in surplus for trade should spend heavily more. That will help the countries that are in deficit of trade, like France, in order to better survive, because we are going to order more champagne, maybe, uh, or, or whatsoever, but, uh, but if we spend more and Germany spends more, then the imbalance probably are going to shrink. The debt GDP eventually will fall because now we are most, almost everyone but Germany in the club of the above 100% uh, debt. So we are mostly Ruritanian. Uh, and the Krakosian will follow suit once they are off the, off the, the balance, uh, uh, of, of, of the balance uh, funds uh, is computed. So we will be mostly Ruritanians, so countries with uh, debt GDP above 100%, and probably this is going to be a way to get out of uh, the mess. But <laughs> probably this is not going to happen. Well, and that's why yeah. probably I hope that between the two different paths we are going to, to witness uh, the one that, uh, that Wolfgang mentioned that uh, we recognize uh, that we are not able at the moment for political constraint to do the right things. And if we are not able to, for political constraints to do right, the right things, uh, then uh, we, we have uh, the, the, the fluctuation of the currency will do the magic. Fantastic. Thank you, Claudio. <laughs> well, that's, that brings, uh, thank you. That, that brings our panel to an end on an excellent note. More pressure into the economy for productivity growth, and we become like Ruritania. So this evening, do we have a ball? We have costume for Balkan, Balkan <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. But uh, this, we can at least think about that and imagine it and enjoy uh, that prospect. Thank you all very Christopher, much. Indeed. Thank Christopher, you all for, for joining us. Christopher. Christopher. This should always be open. Christopher, I have bad news and two questions for you. Ah. So the bad news is that since we have a delay, you have some 20 minutes more in case you wish to ask more questions to our distinguished speakers. And the two questions would be for Jens, if I'm allowed please, to. Please, please. Yeah. Um, one is um, a provocation that comes from my experience in politics. Politics is an interesting job because it allows you to, to uh, meet a lot of interesting people. A CEO of an important bank just after the sanctions to, to Russia uh, so confessed to me that he was angry and really puzzled because he didn't know how to, to behave uh, seeing this split of the world in two. And, and he was wondering whether in order to mitigate geopolitical risk, he had to duplicate all its structure, including its cloud. So by having an American cloud and a Chinese or Eastern cloud, <coughs> in a bipolar wor world, this is my provocation, the euro is in a sense is bound to disappear. I mean, the euro is a dollar that couldn't make it. <laughs> uh, 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 as I put it, this could explain why 
despite the rise in interest rate, in your interesting slide, you see that the euro is keeping a very low level into the international reserve currency because people are feeling that it doesn't help them to diversify uh, geopolitical risk. This could be uh, uh, an idea that I offer to your discussion. Another very short point I would make, I don't really think that next generation EU is a progress in, in, in European fiscal integration. Well, in a sense it is because for the first time we have something similar to uh, a European public debt. But in another sense, since from, uh, I mean, the back end, from the users end of those funds, it is uh, a big constriction on uh, the uh, freedom of, uh, of Italy to spend basically its money, because this money either comes from Italy or has been borrowed by Italy, <laughs> indirectly, I mean. And in that case, you know, we have huge constrictions on, 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 on how to spend it. We, we have to spend it on, on fancy things like inclusion and, and, and all that, and we cannot spend it on, on traditional things like roads, uh, of which you may have appreciated the dire state yesterday and today here in Abruzzo. Yeah, so uh, I would add one thing to the, the next generation EU, right? And that is it's temporary, right? It's not a permanent solution, right? It was set up explicitly to be a, a measure that was put in place to counter the COVID shocks, right? So uh, it's a temporary solution. Even, uh, you can discuss whether it was structured the right way, but we can all agree it was temporary, right? So from that perspective, it doesn't solve the structural problem. And that's why I said, okay, it kind of, it helped for a period of time, and now we're looking into a period where it will expire. Uh, so that's definitely the case. The reserve chart, maybe I didn't stress it enough when I showed it, that chart also has to do with Russia, right? Because Russia sold all their European instruments and bought Chinese bonds instead. So Russia is a big part of all these different themes. It shows up in different ways in all the different charts, even in that chart. Uh, Russia was a big part of the flow. So um, it is just something where I grew up in Denmark, right? I remember when I grew up in Denmark in the 70s and the 80s, all the bomb shelters were closed. Like in the first grade, we uh, learned to go into the bomb shelter and there was a practice every week uh, with the air attack sirens, right? And then after a while, that's been dismantled. We've lived in a certain way in, in the many Many, many years, right? We're not used to thinking. I think it's important that everybody just they are very clear that now it's totally different. And how we address that is something that needs to be embedded directly in the budgets and how that extra funding is allocated, whether it goes internally. We can have a debate about what's the most effective way to protect ourselves, right? But it needs to be debated because it's not the old world anymore. But Jens, uh, Alberto's question uh, was specifically on whether this ten tendency to a bipolar world, the US family on one side and then the, the other family, which I mean, China is not really a leader in any way, but uh, it orients itself around China. And what you described on the Russian reserves is a perfect example of this. I mean, the, Russia was a the biggest exter single external participant in the euro uh, reserves holding, yes. which is why uh, the vast majority of the Russian reserves which have been frozen are in Europe, yes. they're held in euros, yes. and Russia has simply been pushed outside the, the dollar and the euro system. So this, this tendency which Alberto mentioned of, the, of a world which is moving apart, uh, his question, if I understood Alberto correctly, is does does this, uh, what does this mean for the euro as a reserve currency? And could this be something which could accelerate those trends which you were showing in your, in your charts? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say two things. The first thing is that we also used to take for granted that US was a form of ally, right? And uh, I, I lived, lived in the US almost for 10 years. Uh, I, um, uh, I moved to the United States, New York in 2004, right? And U.S. politics are very hard to understand. And now they go in a direction where uh, one of the two 
main political parties is literally unrecognizable from what it was uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, right? So everything we assumed about US politics 10, year ago, 10 years ago is just totally wrong today. So that also has profound impl implications, right? Because I just showed you on the chart, US military spending uh, is it, so much higher than European military spending. And it used to be for European security purposes, but it's just no longer the case anymore. So that has to be taken into account. Um, so it is a different world in, uh, in so many ways. And we just have to recognize that as opposed to planning for the past. Well, uh, Wolfgang, would you have any comments on Alberto's questions, one or either or both of them? Yeah, let me, let me follow up on this, on this, this latter point. And I think this is, this is I, I, agree, I agree with Jens that we need, uh, that, we, uh, that Europeans have traditionally misjudged American politics. They have, and still today, while people are now at least recognizing the possibility that Trump may win the next election, they are not made any preparations for that. Our fiscal policy is not, does not have the room for maneuver for an increase in defense spending. If the US were to pull back out of supporting Ukraine, uh, there is no way the, U the Europeans could take up the slack. We have seen reports of a 30% drop in uh, ammunition from the United States to Ukraine since October. Uh, the Germans have promised a small increase of about 10% um, that will not cover the, the shortfall by a, a wide margin. Um, the Europeans are unprepared for that eventuality. Uh, also in our budget planning, we've seen how, how difficult it was for the Germans even to approach the 2%. Uh, it's a rich country, but the politics in that country does not you know, allow for 3%. Uh, this, is not, this is not going to happen. Um, so I fear for a number, and I also believe there is a potential catastrophe waiting in Ukraine. A, uh, I didn't a hear, catastrophe sorry. waiting for us in Ukraine. In Ukraine, yes. Uh, because because um, uh, you, you, you may have seen the reports in the German media today of a secret deal between the United States and the German government to reduce weapons deliveries to Ukraine to force Zelensky to cut a deal uh, with Putin in the spring. That's the, the news there. Uh, and the scenario would probably that Putin will probably not even take a deal because he will be better off under Trump. Uh, so we could, we, there are scenarios where this war could, would, would turn into some real, something really horrible. Uh, and I don't even want to, and, and, and I also believe that the, the you know, even though I'm not an expert on US politics, uh, I also it, it believe it would not be rational for Biden to want to be uh, to expose to this war while, while running against Trump. Um, you know, he would expose himself and Ukraine to some kind of hor horrible accident in the last part of the campaign. Uh, and, and it would be very uncertain what effect that would have on the, and both his election and also on the war in Ukraine and the, the willingness of allied support. Um, and so I, I see, see there's certainly scenarios, so really some bad scenarios. I thought Georgia Maloney gave the game away when she talked to these Russian pranksters uh, who uh, pretended to be African dignitaries and, uh, and told her, we're all very tired. And she also said, uh, interestingly, the press didn't make much of it. We have a secret plan in the drawer. Now, we don't know what plan that is, but I think it is something like what we heard about Germany and the United States. Yep. We're going to do less and see. We're going to softly force you into cutting a deal because we're not going to keep, we cannot keep this, this thing up for a very long time. And, uh, and, and, and you know, there is sort of a, a wishful thinking in European politics. And whilst we are struggling with a stability pact, uh, you know, a fiscal rule that is unsustainable, nonsensical economically, and you know, it's also nonsensical politically because we have to have these investments you know, in order to do even artificial intelligence would require significant investments. Yep. But, but the military thing we need uh, is, is of such an order of magnitude. There's no way we can do this in, 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 in any sort of fiscal, fiscal, uh, fiscal framework. So I think this is a, there, there's some, is a moment of truth ahead in the, next 20, uh, in the next 12 months. Yeah. So there you have another catalyst for this moment of truth, yeah. this parting of ways, uh, some emergency link to the developments in the Ukraine war. 
Uh, now, Alberto, you gave us an extension of time. Everyone is sitting very patiently. Uh, uh, the, um, I think we have a coffee, coffee and tea break right now, and then uh, the discussions will continue on the big questions of inflation, de-dollarization, and the rest of it. Once again, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.